Thank you, Manuel, for joining us um, today in Basel. Um, we would love to talk to you about your new project, the Tambacunda Hospital in Senegal, um, a competition you won uh, recently, and it's a project that is now under construction, as far as I understand. And um, we're particularly interested to talk about um, not only the product, a kind of finished or polished architecture that could be uh, published in glossy magazines, but uh, we would really love to discuss the process and also very much the role of the architect here. Um, what was your and what is your um, relationship to the local? To start maybe with this uh, yeah. rather obvious question, yeah. or what is the local here? That's a very good start. Um, but first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, I think what the Tambacunda Hospital project uh, shows me and shows us uh, is the kind of the extreme wide dimensions that practice, uh, the, that the term practice, the discipline of practice in a way can take. And maybe that's contained in almost all architectural projects, but here it really kind of uh, is sharply focused. Uh, uh, to start with the question of the local is maybe also to start with the question of the uh, how the project actually started uh, itself. Uh, I, I, and it's a kind of an anecdote I have to tell. Um, I got this email invitation to participate in, an, uh, in a competition. Um, dear Manuel Herz, uh, uh, we are honored to invite you. Uh, you are one of ten architects to uh, compete uh, uh, with this, uh, for this project. Uh, you won't earn any money with it, but it's for a good cause, and, and so on and so on. It's, it's a foundation, an American foundation that is funding it. And then I was thinking about it, and after a while I, I wrote a response email uh, saying thank you so much for this invitation. It's, I feel really honored to be one of the participants. It's a region that I love. It's a topic that is so worthwhile to, um, to uh, work on uh, and a context that I'm really also engaged in. Um, but I've decided to decline. I've decided not to participate in the competition because I think it's not correct that 10 architects sitting in Basel, Berlin, London, New York, Paris, are inventing a solution, quote-unquote solution, the final product for a region that they have never visited, for doctors that they have never spoken to, for uh, 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 patients that they have never met, uh, and for a kind of a craft and a climate that they don't know, so the question of the local. Um, I'm sure you'll find good projects. Thank you, goodbye. Um, uh, I, I, I added also I would have liked to have a more a collaborative process of developing the project rather than a competitive process. And then two hours later, I receive a telephone call uh, saying, uh, listen, your response really kind of hit a nerve and uh, showed us that we are maybe on the wrong track. Uh, let's meet. Uh, and out of this let's meet came a commission, basically. Um, and that's uh, what you were asking, is, is, is the local, uh, how can we approach a project in Tambacunda uh, in this example from, I don't know, from afar, uh, don't we have to undergo a completely different process or, uh, 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 let's say, not a completely, but quite a different process in approaching such a project? Yeah, because there, there is, uh, and there's been a number of people that have written about this that, that we're familiar with, like A.L. Weissman and, and Andrew Hersher, there is this, um, this kind of contradiction to this idea of humanitarian architecture, right, or this lesser evil. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I wonder, I mean, what are some of the ways that, that, you, that you actually addressed this, um, this paradox of, of being a Basel-based uh, Basel architect, but yet creating a new space in a, in a new hospital in Senegal? Um, so first of all, we didn't start designing. Uh, we didn't start with the design, we started with research. Uh, so we went there uh, with a team, uh, maybe two, three weeks, investigating the region, um, spending time with the doctors, trying to understand what they really uh, need and what they want, what's the climate there, what's the fauna, what's the flora there, um, a very in-depth uh, research. And then it was more a collaborative uh, process of designing, not to say that the doctors are designing, but uh, that uh, we are really trying to work out together what is good and what works for them and what doesn't work for them. That, 
um, we don't bring a ready-made solution from, from outside, uh, but that, that it emerges much more um, organically, uh, maybe from a conversation uh, rather from, uh, than from an imposition. But this um, uh, kind of interaction um, between me and, and the local context um, did not only take place in the beginning, uh, but kind of played out really through out the whole process, uh, the planning, the application, the funding, uh, the start of the implementation, which became much, much, much more richer than in a conventional setting. Mm -hmm. So I guess you had, uh, as you described, um, it was a very collaborative process, or still it is, I guess. Um, so I'm, I'm imagining you have a, a local partner, or how can we understand the organization of that building work, because uh, what's interesting about architecture in general is certainly this it's a very particular distribution of labor mm -hmm. going on, yeah. and maybe eventually a building um, will be just communicated uh, in our sphere under the name of the architect, yeah. but of course we know there are many more people involved. Yeah. Um, maybe you can give a bit of an insight how in your particular project, um, these collaboration functions, because uh, an architect is unable to work on his own. On the site, yeah. Um, so one key person is um, the Mageba, uh, who is the, the builder, basically, the construction uh, master of the construction site. Um, but what is particular about uh, Mage Ba is he's a doctor, in fact. Um, <coughs> he's educated and practices as a village doctor, um, but he's quite an ingenious coordinator of, of works. Um, and uh, he has uh, produced other buildings uh, in the past, for example, with Toshiko Mori. He built a, a kind of a cultural center in also rural uh, Senegal in the region there. And just to show you one of the ways in which kind of different in interests not only overlap but produce something new, uh, maybe another anecdote. Um, uh, the building itself, the design that we eventually worked out, uh, depends a lot on natural ventilation and um, natural cooling and uh, a kind of a brisole wall, so a, a brick wall uh, which lets the air pass through. And uh, I had asked um, Mageba to make a test facade uh, for this um, uh, for this hospital, and I asked him, uh, why don't you take a, a piece of the land on the hospital site uh, to build a, a test facade? I sent him some drawings. And then after a while, <coughs> um, he sent us back some photographs, and I noticed it's not exactly what I sent him as the test facade, and it's not certainly not on the hospital site. And it turned out uh, more and more that it's more than a wall. Um, it be turned into an actual building. Um, and instead of building a test facade, he built a village school out of the test facade. So he extended the, the walls of the test facade to become a real hmm. building, uh, four walls and a roof, um, because he anyway had to build uh, or was in the process of there was a village that needed a school, uh, so he took advantage of us needing a test facade and he extended it into a small school, hmm. which I think is brilliant and beautiful. Um, of taking kind of my logic and my interests and translating it to, into his logic and his interests and the local needs and producing a new product, which is a kind of a co-designed, co-shared, uh, co-produced uh, village school now. Can, can I also ask, I mean, I imagine there were funds from the project that were allocated to building the test wall, and these funds came from the foundation that, that commissioned it. So what were your clients, what was their response when they heard there was also a new school building built, you know, using kind of the same system? They, they loved it. Uh, I think they are, um, uh, they were extremely happy. It's, it's maybe more, even more amusing because the funds that he had to build the village school without knowing yet about the test facade came from the Rihanna Foundation, the singer. Um, uh, so it also shows maybe the international network that is established. So this little, uh, uh, the doctor in the little village in rural, rural mm -hmm. Senegal gets connected to the Rihanna Foundation um, of the super mega pop star mm -hmm. um, and uh, then collaborates with the uh, Josef and Annie Albers uh, uh, Foundation to build this 
uh, kind of hybrid test facade school in a village, uh, but uh, every everyone but benefits in a way. Uh, it's, uh, it was a wonderful kind of abuse of, of a silly test facade, mm -hmm. which now, uh, thinking back, I, I admit is so idiotic to let's just build a wall. I mean, if we build a wall, let's make something more out of it. Let's use yeah. that wall. Yeah. Yeah. How, how would you describe the, um, the role of foundations, and in particular, um, in particular the, the Josef and Annie Albers Foundation, um, Maybe you can describe a bit what they're doing um, and how how they select a project um, because I think it also demands a certain knowledge from their side or a network and how does is this played out in the or what are the effects on a larger scale yeah. in Senegal because of course we we um, we know that you have been doing research in many areas in in Africa over the past decade probably and um, so you are you must be aware of the huge dimension of of uh, issues potentials problems etc yeah no ab absolutely and and we we have to be very sensitive and aware of the pitfalls that this can take and of course I mean you you mentioned the humanitarian architecture, the NGO culture that uh, comes in uh, with the kind of parachutes in, parachutes out again, uh, which can be extremely problematic and we are not aware of, of uh, the repercussions that any kind of construction sometimes has. Um, I don't want to be too kind of uh, paying homage to my foundation, but uh, uh, I do think that they so what makes them different is that they are very much locally invested and long-term invested. They have been in Senegal for 20 years or so, and they focus really on two places, the region of Tambacounda and, and um, the capital. Uh, um, and um, they don't uh, kind of surf. Uh, they don't uh, hip -hop from, uh, hop from place to place to place. Uh, and I think this is one of the main ingredients that makes their work more substantial than maybe um, we know these uh, um, humanitarian architecture projects, maybe in quotations, that, uh, oh, let's build, a, I don't know, um, a kindergarten in a slum in Soweto or in, in uh, Kibera in, uh, in Nairobi. Um, let's make a design here, let's go there, build it in two weeks, and then let's go back and see what happens. Uh, these will always fail. Uh, they will never be good. Um, because uh, we don't know what happens to the buildings, and this is more important than uh, maybe the building itself. Can I can I tell another kind of, or can I exemplify this? Um, so, for example, um, this same foundation, the Albers Foundation, uh, built a school, also another rural village school in Senegal. Um, Toshiko Mori designed it, and um, it's beautiful school, and it took maybe two years to to design and to construct but to convince the head of the local mosque that girls can go to that school and that not only the Quran is being taught, took five years and will take another one or two years really to implement. So that is the actual work, um, maybe even more than just designing the school and that the foundation is willing to do that is really laudable and that maybe makes it different from um, some of the silly NGO architecture, which sometimes can have really destructive uh, uh, repercussions. But do, do you think it differs in your case uh, due to the due to the programmatic uh, nature that you know education is something that is um, slightly more ideological, whereas healthcare and a hospital, it's it's life or death. So I mean. I, I imagine, and I'd like to hear more about these consultations that you had with the doctors, because I imagine if you, know, if you get the doctors on board, they will kind of promote the project, and because they are the ones that will actually be using it. But I also wondered to what extent, I mean, that this is, this is an expansion to the only hospital in the, in the region, correct? Yeah. Yes, but I mean, with any program, uh, the social political comes into play and, and interacts with the architecture. So for example, uh, what is, uh, it's a maternity and pediatric hospital, what is uh, very common for some maybe silly reason in, in Eastern Senegal is um, cesarean births. Uh, the majority of births are um, uh, uh, through cesarean sections. Uh, and 
because there's also some state support uh, that the mothers receive, and and I don't know the exact uh, all the exact reasons, but uh, we are trying to shift that uh, also. Uh, kind of going along with the construction of the hospital to shift that policy and also cultural uh, kind of status now uh, that has emerged and shift it back to na natural births. Uh, uh, and that is also a longer process that maybe will go much beyond the actual construction of the hospital and we have to work with the doctors to um, create a, a kind of a, a shift uh, in, in perception of, of how uh, kind of what techniques of birth are, are being used. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and, and I think I, I want to be involved in that, or I see the architecture not just as a backdrop to that, but as an, an active agent in that. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I think it's uh, clear that you're aiming at, at, a, at a kind of very inclusive uh, understanding of a project that's not just f finished at a certain point, that you're, there's an involvement that um, um, would probably endure. Um, I'd be interested in actually also hearing um, more about problems that occur, mm -hmm. um, also the contradictions to, this, to a certain extent. You know, I'm, I'm also from my own experience, uh, having worked a bit in India for a while, um, is that it's actually quite, of course, there is an idea of collaboration, uh, yet uh, there, there is difference. And uh, you know, there's this classic in, in sociology, also a uh, classic difference between uh, local informants and uh, foreign experts. Yeah. And is it possible to to really get rid of this, or how can you deal with difference? And um, what I'd be interested to to hear what kind of contradictions mm -hmm. also occurred during the process. Mm -hmm. And I guess problems or contradictions are not, not only uh, negative for me, or not per se, could be very, you could have very productive misunderstandings. I mean, one, uh, of course there are uh, contradictions and there's also dilemmas and, and um, sides that are problematic. Um, one is, of course, connected to, or there's a whole dimension of dilemmas connected to the financial, economical um, difference, disparity, you know? The building will cost about a million and a half euros, um, one, one and a half million euros. Um, uh, my, the salary that I pay my employees to work on this is a substantial proportion of that, so, uh, uh, it's maybe unfair to spend so much money on salaries here in Switzerland when, uh, yeah, we, we, should we do it rather in, in, in Senegal? Uh, so, of course, we are trying to limit also the expenses, uh, but that only goes to a certain extent. The, it's the Josef Al uh, and Annie Albers Foundation. One painting of Josef Albers with the squares cost a million and a half. Um, uh, so the the equivalence is perverse. It's yeah. disgusting in a way. Uh, you know, you can either have a, a hospital in eastern Senegal or, or one more painting. Yeah, but but so what's actually perverse about that, right? It's it's maybe that you know you you just get a painting for one and a half million, whereas yeah. you can be creating an extension to a hospital that that yeah. transforms everybody's life. But uh, shouldn't it almost suggests, and this is maybe a very populistic. Um, uh, conclusion, uh, let's sell all the paintings and build a hundred hospitals. Um, but, yeah, that, but that, but that, that might be too easy in a way. Of course. Because um, this is also where, um, coming back to the question of humanitarian uh, architecture, is an engagement is, of course, there, there are different ways to look at it. And one is for sure um, being super critical vis-a-vis -vis that kind of vis-a-vis -vis the economic mechanisms and inequalities and say, well, it's not even worth intervening, let things grow organically and it will be solved somehow. Yeah. Um, the other version is, well, it might still be interesting to produce mis productive misunderstandings and to have experts and yeah. because maybe it's not obvious what the end will be, and this is why uh, I think something that Nick mentioned uh, in Andrew Hirsch's book, Displacements, he, 
he talks about some of the beginnings of humanitarian architecture in the mid 19th century in Victorian England, uh, where basically there were, there were people were making big st or studies of um, yeah, poor neighborhoods in Bethnal Green and were trying to improve it. And they were very quickly blamed by the press as humanity mongers, yeah. Yeah, making a business out of uh, poverty. Yeah. But some of these people who were actually architects and other people who tried to help, uh, they were actually taking this not as an insult. They said, yes, it's a business. We are experts in it, and we're good. Yeah. I, I mean, so yeah. it's, a, it's a different position. Yeah. I, I mean, what, what fascinates me also about my own role there is that um, there's not a golden path. Uh, no, you, you always make your hands dirty. Um, and um, I think that, in uh, in the end, also shows us something about architecture in the in the whole as a whole. Um, that whatever we do good, we will always fuck things up at the same time. Uh, and I think that that kind of path that uh, um, we try to improve things with any kind of building, um, we want to to make a kind of improved situation. We will always also fuck things up. But maybe more specifically to to Tambagunda. Um, uh, yes, we could either say um, let's just uh, kind of allow for potential and let them work it out themselves, um, but that's uh, a very almost also, um, I don't know, arrogant or, or a disillusionist uh, kind of position, or one can go in with a kind of hyper NGO attitude, uh, we know we have the solution, let's fix it, um, but maybe there's a middle ground that maybe sound boring on surface, but is actually much, much wiser. That depends really on a few key people also who have a certain kind of sensitivity and know uh, the limits um, of what to do. Um, and um, then you cannot multiply it endlessly. You know? This foundation cannot build a hundred hospitals because they have to, they cannot send an army uh, there, but they are dependent on two, three, four, five people who do it right. Uh, and uh, so that's maybe another solution to uh, why we can't sell all the Albers paintings and produce 100 hospitals. Uh, this kind of mix of, of individuals that have a certain kind of sensitivity and awareness is, is important. Yeah, I mean, I think it also, uh, in a certain extent, has to do with an, an attunement to the way that change happens, right, or the way that territories can be transformed, yeah. right? And so, you know, it's very easy for NGOs, as you said, to kind of come in and say, we have the solution. But at the same time, and I, I, I use this word not as a way to, uh, not as an excuse for anything, but I do think a, a certain degree of humility as to like what the, as to, and, and, and as a way to kind of manage expectations um, for these types of projects might be, mm -hmm kind of the, you know, in essential ingredient. Yeah. Can I um, uh, say, uh, tell one more uh, anecdote? Um, <clears throat> we had, uh, which uh, speaks about this humility, I think. Um, we had a, uh, a meeting where we presented uh, the project then finally to the governor and to the board of the hospitals and every employee of the hospital. And I thought the governor will come in with his uh, entourage, will let me speak for 10 seconds and then take over and explain to me maybe the proposal because uh, it's, uh, he has the authority. He listened to me uh, for 25 minutes. <clears throat> he gave a very good, sharp response and then he asked every person in the room uh, what he or she thought about the hospital process, uh, about the design from the doctor, from the director to the, I don't know, the technician and the handyman of the hospital. Um, and. Uh, he listened to them for two hours, uh, and finally he said, uh, Manuel, if you take into consideration all the comments that were made uh, by all the technicians, handyman, uh, uh, I don't know, um, hebamme, um, um, uh, how do you say, um, uh, uh, the nurses and the doctors, I hereby give you the planning permission. Uh, and that's a beautiful combination of kind of basic democracy, humility, of listening really to everyone, and a kind of authoritarianism of knowing that he has the power to declare and give planning permission. Uh, and this combination, I think, is a beautiful mix of humility and authority at the same time. That is maybe a good ingredient.
Wonderful. I, I think that's a, that's a lovely ending place, uh, a kind of a weird optimism. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, thank you so much, Manuel, for, uh, for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Nick and Nicholas.